Y'all wanna get turned? I heard as you trying to go climb to the top. I start from the bottom, it's kinda like putting on socks. You ready? Yeah. Y'all ready or not? Don't let me get hot though. Clean like a mob. Whole world is shot. This place gon' not. This place gon' ride. Y'all ready or not? Ready or not? You ready or not? You ready or not? Pay my dues. Punch that clock. You ready or not? You ready or not? Ready or not? You ready or not? You ready or not? You ready or not? Pay my dues. Punch that clock. Hey, what's going on? Welcome back to another episode of Pain to Profits. And today we got Richard Thagerlin with Trustology. He is a management, change management consultant, leadership consultant. You've been working in entrepreneurship and leadership for a really long time. So we're super pumped to have you get your perspective and your story on what it uh, took to go from pain to profit. Yes, sir. Excited well, to be here. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming. So it's been a long time. I said this to you offline, but you can't be in Northern Colorado and not be connected by one or two degrees of separation. Yeah. Um, but how long have you been here in Fort Collins? And how long have you been running your business here in Northern Colorado? Yeah, so I was born in Fort Collins, Poudre Valley Hospital. I was born Rare. there, all four of my boys born there. But I grew up about three hours east of here in a small farm community. I went to CSU, met my wife. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> uh, we're all sorry right now to hear that. That's right, yeah, the buffs aren't doing much better. <laughs> And I moved away when I got married, and in 2000, we moved back. And that's when we started having a family. I moved back. Uh, I, in 2001, started Peak Solutions and have been doing that ever since. Awesome. So what do you guys do? What is, what is Peak Solutions? So Peak Solutions is technically, I think that the IRS reporting schedule is it's a management consulting firm, which doesn't mean much to anyone, but we do three main things. We develop... Uh, very customized leadership development programs inside a large, larger, medium to larger scale companies. We do strategic planning inside of those companies. And then we do exec, ex, we call it executive consulting. It's executive coaching. Um, but we believe instead of just coaching the executives and business leaders and owners one on one, that you have to coach their the system that they're a part of as well. So it's more of a holistic, we, we coach not just the individuals, but their their teams or their organizations that they're part of. And that's what we do. And you wrote a great book called Trustology. You did. And you said something in that book that I love, which is trust isn't earned, right? It's given. Yeah. Can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah. I didn't know that till I said it the first time. <laughs> I um, I was at the Stanley Hotel speaking to a group of realtors, uh, legendary real, real estate guru, Larry Kendall, who founded the group. The group, yeah. Yeah. He asked me to come speak to this group of realtors. Uh, I, this would have been like 2005, six, and, uh, and, and I could pick the topic. And I'm trying to think, what could I talk about? And the curriculum that we use had a segment on trust. And so I was digging into it. I thought, well, that'd be a good thing to share with this group of realtors. You know, they're, they're going into people's homes and helping them with one of the biggest financial decisions of their lives. And so I put together an hour program on trust. And at the end I had some, some Q and a, and someone asked me a question and just out of my mouth was, well, trust isn't something that you earn. It's something that you give. And if you're not willing to give it, you'll never get it. And I didn't say it terribly confidently. Like I just did. <laughs> and the whole group looked at me like I had just like killed their pet <laughs> and they crossed their arms and I got backed into a corner. And so they became the protagonist or the antagonist, and I became the protagonist, and I had two choices at that point. I could say the truth, which was like, time out. I, <laughs> I just thought of this. I don't never thought of, I don't know what, I'm, what, I, what I mean by that. Um, or I could try, try and defend it. So right there on the spot, backed into the corner, as they started confronting me about that statement, I started, um, I started defending it. Pontificating, yeah, basically. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And when I was done, they were all like, oh, huh, that's interesting. So I drive down the mountain back to Fort Collins. And I'm thinking about that. And for the next couple of weeks, that, that really haunted me. So I started looking for places where that was true. And what did that look like? And, you know, the deeper I dug into it, the more I realized, man, this isn't just, this isn't just true. It's actually truth. Because if you think about from a Christian worldview, uh, from a from like a biblical perspective, what does God ask of us? He asks us to trust us with all of our heart and our mind and our soul and our strength and to put our faith in him and to trust others. And Proverbs talks about, you know, trusting one another and to to offer and give that. 
yet man has created this idea that trust is some big you know prize at the top of a mountain that you got to climb up and and just you know bestow upon people so the deeper i dug into it the more i realized there's a ton of truth in that and i think it represents a change in thinking but i think the key the key when i talk to people now like you know almost 20 years later is that you have it's a vocabulary problem more than it's a heart problem is that people don't we don't all have the same definition of trust we don't all have the same definition of hurt we don't all have the same definition of risk and when we start to have common definitions then we can have common meaning and so that really uh, helps unpackage that. So just to put that on a bumper sticker, people don't wide, widely agree with that. But when you start having a further conversation, you do. Well, I think like in the simplest terms, I think about like dating, for example. Like if I go into a date and I'm just arms closed and very closed off, then it's going to be really hard or challenging for the other person to open up right. as well. Right. So when we assume that the other person isn't trustworthy and they have to earn my trust, right. I've already put up a barrier of entry to just get into the fold. I'm a, if you've ever taken a disc test, I'm like off the charts. I, I love people. So that's my default state is yeah. I'm just going to embrace you and love you until you give me a reason not to trust you. Right. And I believe personally that's something over the years that's allowed me to be a really good leader because I've already assumed positive intent until you do something to prove me wrong. Yeah. But what's your definition of trust, at least how you define it in the book? Because you said we had different definitions of it. Well, let me back up a quick second, is that there's a lot of people that are in your boat. There's really kind of two camps that are major camps, and there's a lot of little camps around, but the two camps are I don't trust anybody until you've proven me wrong, or I trust everyone, and then when you prove me wrong, I change it. And both of those have flaw. And so... and, and agree with that? The, the reason why the what you know in your situation where it's like all right i'm gonna offer the trust and then something happens and i back off that's not really trust it's conditional trust you actually are looking for and expecting someone to do something wrong so that you can back that trust off right and then the other person that's stingy with it not willing to give it they wait till there's no risk and then all of a sudden they trust well that's actually not trust yeah. you've already eliminated all the risk there's no need for trust in that moment so Back to vocabulary. My my definition um, it always requires further explanation. So the definition is confidence in your relationship with others. And so confidence actually is the most important word in the definition, my definition anyway, of trust. So we can have high confidence. We can have low confidence. And we're, we're looking for confidence that the other person is going to be benevolent. Confidence that the other person is going to honor what they say. Confidence that they're going to create a safe environment. And it's not until we introduce the, the trust model that it all of a sudden makes sense. So we have a three-legged stool. And the three legs of the stool are integrity, competence, and compassion. And so for, for most people, I would challenge them to think of someone that maybe they don't trust. Not someone that they don't trust and they don't care that they trust someone that they don't necessarily trust and they wish that they could or that they wish the other way around, that the other person would trust them more, where you hope for that relationship to be better. And if you, if you think of a specific person, likely it's one, two, or maybe all three of those legs that's the problem versus that you don't trust them. It's not likely that you don't trust the person. It's likely that you have low confidence in their integrity. That's right? good. They don't honor their commitments. They don't fall through. And I think... So just specifically to our audience, how do, because the biggest trap I see for aspiring new entrepreneurs is they hold everything close to the chest. If you've ever read Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth, it's because they start off as technicians, their identity's wrapped up in what they do, right? Not necessarily who they are. They're not okay with being the master generalist. So they, they hold everything tight and they end up just building a glorified job for themselves. And so... I also think that that's partially because they don't actually trust or think that anybody can do it better than they can. Yeah. So what advice do you have for those people who are trying to grow their team and, and bring more people into the fold? Cause let's face it. There's no great company that's ever been built on the back of, you know, one singular person. So you've got to have yeah. people on your team. Well, I think the first question is what kind of life do you want to live? 
And if you want to live a life where everyone's on your shoulders and you're carrying them, then keep doing that. Be the, be the genius with a thousand helpers. Right. And if you don't, if you don't desire or value the freedom that comes from a multi multiplicative way of, you know, multiplying yourself, then keep doing that because there are a lot of geniuses who really are the best. Um, the, the, the conversation I often have is, are you, do you want to be a plumber or do you want to own a plumbing company? Right. Right. And, and there's nothing, there's literally nothing wrong with being the plumber. It just doesn't give you and afford you some of the options that you have elsewhere. Also, if you want to be the plumbing owner company owner, then things might not be done the exact way that you would do them. And there's a reason for that is because the people that you have working for you, if they would do it as well as you did or like you would do it, they would own their own companies. Right. But they're not. They're choosing to come under your umbrella and work for you. So I think the question is, who do you want to be? Yeah. And what kind of life do you want to live? And what sacrifice are you willing to make for that? And that's what this requires is a sacrifice. And so, you know, trust, so to speak, doesn't come without risk. There's always risk associated with it. Do you think it's a good line in the sand for people to kind of determine whether or not they should work for somebody else or they should be an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think, I think one, I think your relationship with risk, a lot of people will say, what's your risk tolerance? But I think I like to better say, what's your relationship to risk? Because it really is about a personal relationship. You know, like what's my tolerance for my kids or my wife is right. very different than what's my relationship with them. Right. And so everyone has a relationship to risk. And when you're clear about what that relationship looks like, that that lets you know what degree you can enter into that. And so some people can be an entrepreneur and they're going to eliminate some of the upside uh, of being an entrepreneur by eliminating some of the risk and buying a franchise. Mm -hmm. It's very, very low risk. There's a proven system and a process. You have people who've gone before you. You're doing it just like everyone else. And this you are. Box, right? Yeah, do it. And if your relationship to risk is low, that kind of entrepreneurism is very much for you. If you want to create something from nothing and birth something, then your relationship to risk has to be has to be positive. And um, I also think that your support system early on, I didn't I didn't know that. I didn't I didn't pay attention to that of what my support system needed and and how different that relationship to risk was is that like the mentors around you the other entrepreneurs your family more i'm more thinking my family like my mm -hmm. wife when in 2001 when i quit my corporate job paid me money whether i was working or not yeah it was a great gig when i quit that no money no clients nothing and i just i'm gonna start something from scratch my relationship with risk was very different than my wife's now both of us felt a deep deep calling that this was the right thing to do. Matter of fact, right before, like two or three weeks before I ended up quitting my job, my wife said, it feels like right now all these doors are opening up and it would be, it would be more dangerous to not follow God's leading in this business than it would to go bankrupt, which yeah. talk about a superstar partner in that. But my, but what I learned was over time, her relationship with risk was very different. So <laughs> if I would have, if I would go back 21 years and talk to myself then, I would I would focus more on giving her some areas of stability that were important to her instead of just asking her to trust me. Because while she did trust me, it caused her more pain and problem than, than she needed to have. Okay, so that's, we're going to unpack that. What were you doing before? What was the corporate job? So I, was, I worked for uh, Fortune 1-something, 100-something company, $13 billion. I was... My last job before I quit, I was the head of human resources for five of our customers. So basically, I was an HR executive on loan. And so I sat on the leadership team of five of our customers, and I just traveled every month in between those five and served more strategically as their human resource leader. Got it. And so you said doors were being opened that made it you know, seem like it would almost be silly not to go after them. But was there events leading up to that that – Two questions. Maybe caused you pain or frustration that you're like, ah, I just want to go do my own thing. And was there a catalyst event that uh, maybe said, okay, this is it. I'm done. Yeah. I'm it. Yeah. Both of those are true. I, I always dreamt of being in business for myself. 
always. There was never a time that I didn't. Matter of fact, years and years later, when I ran into old roommates um, from different parts of my life till I got married, um, they would always, you know, when they would meet my wife or they were talking to my kids or whatever, like, your dad was always the idea guy. It was always like, I have an idea. Yeah. And I never did anything with those ideas, but I always had them. So I always wanted to, you know, be in business for myself. Two major things happened. One, my dad lost his job. He'd worked for the same same organization for 26 years. Mm. He was four years away from full pension retirement benefits. And when he lost his job, because of the way the formula works, age, years of service, et cetera, um, his retirement benefits essentially were cut in half. Ouch. And and in the hour after I learned this and talked to him and shared the emotions of that, I promise, I made a vow that I would never put my faith in an organization for my future. So that happened. And then the most catalytic event for me was actually 9-11. So during the terrorist attacks of 9-11, I'm driving home from work, had a five-hour drive back home, and I'm just contemplating, what on earth am I here for? Mm. What is my purpose? What is my call? What if my name had been on the ledger of the thousands of people who perished in that tragic event? Had I lived the life that, the one life that God gave me, and was I doing everything that I could to, to honor that gift of life? And I wasn't doing anything terrible. I was, you know, I was doing great things, but I just like I, I felt like there was a bigger call, and that's what set me. That was in September. By November, I quit my job and was on this path. So if I heard you right. It's a deeper call for more fulfillment and purpose. Yeah, controlling your own destiny. Yeah, and it's interesting that you said that because I have been doing a lot of reflection lately about things that motivate me the most is like when I see somebody who's very old and like on the verge of death, that actually gives me the most inspiration to keep going. Mm. Um, like it's like the deathbed test, right? Yeah. Like I can put myself in that, it's just a bit of stoicism. I can put myself in those shoes for a second and go, when I'm looking back 40 years, yeah. am I going to say, dang, that was, I'm glad I stuck out and just played it safe. Or I'm going to say, no, I like, I did it my way. And I built a life that I loved, mm -hmm. and it wasn't always easy, but, you know, choose your heart, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a common thread between all entrepreneurs of this, I'm going to die one day. But I think it's even more prevalent for Christian entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. people who believe in a higher power. Mm -hmm. How is your faith, because you talk about it a lot, as do I, play a role in just how you operate in business? And how you view risk and tackle fear and the highs and the lows that come along with being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Well, when I was in the corporate world, I hadn't contemplated this very much. One, I was new to my faith. So, you know, my 20s essentially were where I grew in my faith and made it real. I got married at 24, um, had my first kid at 26, started Peak Solutions at 28. So that that time period, I was really growing in my faith, but I didn't really know what an integrated faith looked like. I had my small group and church and time with my wife, and then I would go to work, and it wasn't like I was having a lack of integrity in the areas of my life. I just didn't know how to put them together. And then I found myself sitting in my little rented, rented my first rented office a month after starting Peak Solutions, and the phone rang. And when the phone rang, before I answered it, I just said a quiet little prayer, like, God, what would you have for me in this call? Mm. And I answered it, and it was a telemarketer, and I was <laughs> like, okay, hang up on you is what you have for me in this call. <laughs> but I, I, I was kind of wrecked because I thought I never once ever in the six years that I had been working in the corporate world ever thought, God, what do you have for me in this day, in this week, in this month, in this call, in this relationship? And so I started asking around, what does it mean to lead a company for Jesus? Like, what does that actually look like? And it took me 20 phone calls to find someone who had some thoughts around that. So I got, I got put into a, a group of people that were, you know, meeting every week, trying to lead their companies for Christ, and happened to have, you know, entrepreneurs and business owners and a few pastors in that group. And so that group for about 10 years, versions of that group, really helped me to see that. And one of the things I deeply believe in is that there's, I love, I love economics. It's the wise use of scarce resources. We all Me have too. scarce resources. Yep. 
But God's economy has a whole different level of wisdom and a whole different level of scarce resources because in the end we win no matter what no matter what the journey is. Right. And so there's an unfair advantage of this mindset of you have you have the holy of holies inside of you. You have the creator of heaven and earth inside of you. You have a call and a, you know, a, a purpose. And God calls all of us to different things. And so whatever it is that you've been called to is different maybe than what I've been called to, but we each get to have that platform. And so um, really from that phone call to this day, that's been an ever-present part of, of my life is that I don't go to church and let my church be the ministry. It's like, I want my whole life to be my ministry. I want my family to do that. And my work is just a great extension and platform of that. Yeah. I think that we think that if we're going to do that, be a leader for the faith or for Christ, that we need to be up in a pulpit (laughs) speaking from stage. And that's not how everybody's ministry is. I mean, it shows up in your everyday life. And I, I have a similar story to yours. Um, I've, you know, now I have a men's group of people that I surround myself with who keep me kind of on the straight and narrow and, and, and fill that cup for me and have allowed me to integrate it into my life. I love the way that you said that because it was like work is work, family is family, go to yeah. church, yeah. do my thing, and then I don't really talk about these things throughout the day. But yeah. it's inevitable as you grow in your faith and your confidence in your business and who you are, uh, you realize that your vibe attracts your tribe, right? Right. Right. And it's like, hey, man, if this is who I am, it's why it's why I show up in T-shirt. I got tattoos. It's like this is how I am. You know right. what I mean? Like if you want me to wear a suit and tie, that's just not my vibe. Right. And if that bothers you, then maybe we should do business. Don't kill I'm me o- my tribe. I'm totally okay with that. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yep. It's like being a politician. Like half the country is going to hate you and half the country is going to love you. So yeah. you can't you can't win for losing in that case. Yeah. You can't really live your life that way. So having that authenticity is, I think, is a great way to really go with everything that you're doing, running your business, leading your team, so on and so forth. Well, uh, real quick, a message to all people in, in, well, in all life, not just business and entrepreneurs is Colossians 3.23 says, whatever your hand touches, whatever you do, whatever you choose to do, whatever it is, work as though you're serving the Lord and not man. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the greatest mark of a Christian isn't the fact that you have a fish on the back of your creeper van (laughs) when you pull up as a plumber or that you have even, you know, cross tattoos all over you or that you, you know, play Christian music. It's that you do good work and that the work that you do is your greatest testimony. And I think that's a place where it's in particular Christian business people, they need, we need to let our work be the greatest reflection of our faith. And if we use words and, and use the word to share, that's a, that's a bonus, but people should look up to, uh, the work that Christians do and say, that's the highest standard. Yeah. That's the highest degree because we're not working for each other. We're working for God. I love that. All right. So let's rewind 28, start your business. Uh, what's, what were some of those failures and bumpy roads that you had in those first few years as you're trying to figure it out? And what wisdom did you learn from that that you you know have used going forward? Yeah, I quit my job on Monday, and my wife came to me with a pregnancy test on a positive one on Wednesday. And All right. so that was bumpy, bumpy, and cash was always an issue. Having, you know, having having the resources was was always an issue. Um, I somehow had I don't know where this came from. I somehow had enough. Maybe it was wisdom. Maybe I don't know what it was, but I had enough thought to not say this is what I'm going to do and put my head down and just go hard at it. What I decided was I was going to let the first couple years of my business and my practice determine where I needed to go. Let my customers demand that. Let the, let the market demand that let, you know, what wants to happen. So those first few years were hard because, you know, you asked me, Hey, can you do whatever? You didn't even have to finish the sentence. My answer is yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You want me to mow your lawn? I'll mow your lawn. You want me to write you an employee handbook? I'll do that. You want me to give a talk to your people? Like whatever it is, I'll do it. And in that period of time, I started learning where my strengths and gifts are, what my, what, you know, what type of client I wanted to serve and what I wanted to serve them with. But along that way, there was, there was, you know, lots of confusion and chasing after the wrong things. My first year in business, I gave 52 free presentations. 
you know, I'm just like wherever, whoever. I was on the back of a Pizza Hut one time <laughs> talking to a group of women in encounters. Of yes, <laughs> no, not that back. <laughs> and you know, so I, I I tried I tried a lot of things, and I think that probably the the biggest. I don't know if it's the failure, but the biggest challenge for me was again bringing some security and peace to my wife. And I did. It wasn't. And it probably was a decade in before I really realized how important that was mm-hmm. and what that looked like. And I don't think she at the time knew how important that was or what it looked like. So hindsight's such a gift. Um, but I wanted to. I wish I could have had that in advance. I wish I'd have had a you know something like this to listen to every week so that I could have been challenged by like, wait a minute, there's something that there's something that your partner, your spouse needs. You need to give it to her. Can you clarify that? Like what that, I guess, certainty is that you were trying to create for her and you finally discovered 10 years later. Yeah. I mean, simple as this, if I could go back in time, what I would have done was say, okay, I'm going to deposit X number of dollars every month or twice a month into the bank account no matter whether we have that or not. So I'll utilize a line of credit or something. So you feel secure that we have everything we need and it's there. And instead we were kind of treating the business as though it was our bank account instead of, you know, feeding the business first and then us second. And so whatever was in the business bank account, we'd pull and sometimes we'd pull exactly what we need. Sometimes we wouldn't, sometimes we'd pull more to catch up. And so that one simple thing of I could put $3,000 $3,000 every month into the bank account or whatever the number is. And you can guarantee, you can guarantee that. And if we need something above and beyond, it's going to have to come from, you know, we, we have to bonus ourselves instead of, Oh, it looks like there's a lot in there. Let's pull something out. And, yeah. you know, so then we're kind of pulling against each other um, on, on the finances. There's that. The other is I would have made a commitment around my travel and how much or how little that would have been. And so it was kind of more the mindset of, you know, make hay while the sun shine and go. And then sometimes there wasn't. And so there was inconsistent travel. Sometimes it was a lot. Sometimes it wasn't much. And so I might have created some standards around how much travel I was willing and able to do, especially when the kids were, you know, real little and got babies running around the house. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think we don't take enough time to – you know, you had a job, you left the job, don't create a new job for yourself. So we don't take enough time to step back and say, what does this ideal lifestyle that I want actually look like? Yeah. Um, Cause for me, it was ultimately time, right? I would get up in the morning. I would go and work out, go to the office, work all day, come home, see my kids for a couple hours. I'm exhausted. And I was just getting like snippets of their life. Right. And I wanted a more integrated life see my kids more, watch them grow up, know that I'm there, have those relationships with them. Cause that window is so tiny. My daughter's about to turn 11, you know, and I'm thinking, man, she's going to be 16. She can hate my guts. She's going to be 18. She's going to go off to school, you know? So those, those moments are precious. Yeah. If you could go back and do it again, the first couple years, what would you have done differently? Yeah, well, if I went back with the knowledge I have now, I don't know if I would have had the courage to step out, honestly. Um, it's a little bit. It's good to ignorance, be ignorant. Ignorance <laughs> and, and moxie and, you know, unwarranted confidence, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, um, it sounds like being 28 again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a blessing to that. It's like right now, if I had to stop everything I'm doing right now and start something from scratch with no way forward, A, the three thousand dollars in the bank account is not going to cut it today. Yeah, like it Your did operating then. Operating costs a little higher. <laughs> it's that's different. The risk is different. I got two kids in college: one in high school, one in middle school. You know, I just like the the risk. My relationship with risk isn't different, but what that looks like is different. So, really, I would only do a couple of things differently if I were to go back. And and one is to to have that have that consistent um, financial, you know, confidence. For, for my wife in particular, um, I probably would have would, would have realized that I have a better network than I than I than I than I thought I had. Right. Um, I was always afraid to ask people for help, and now I realize all, all people want to do is help you. Yeah. You ask, will you help me? People die to do that. Yep. And I would have I would have engaged in my network a little bit better. Um, I would have been less focused on how I 
looked and appeared. Uh, you know, I think I've spent a lot of energy and effort looking bigger, bolder, you know, more professional than I needed to be. Yeah, instead um, of just being yourself. <clears throat> yeah. Do, do you think you would have, um, to use a fancy term here, tried to work towards product market fit much sooner instead of being the I'll do everything guy? Well, I, you know, or yeah. Or was it just because you didn't have clarity? It would have been great to do that if I had the clarity of it. If I would have, if I would have done that, I would have, I would have followed my original business plan, which was more Main Street USA, small business, small entrepreneurs is who I thought I would serve. Right. And that would have created a, a very frustrating life for me because that's just not the place where I win the most. Uh, we as small business owners are really hard to serve, quite honestly, by outside consultants because we're the genius and we have the thousand helpers. But I spent you know, the, 11 years in that world. So yeah, it's hard. <clears throat> yeah, very hard. So what, what what point did it start to click? I Two years in, sounds like maybe you started to figure it out. But, you know, you're you're working, you know, more, I'd say, like in the mid to enterprise level type organization now. So what was that point where you're like, okay, got it. I got a couple of big clients. And, and, and actually what happened was <clears throat> one of my big clients was so big that, you know, a March or April project was really enough. It was going to be enough to, to keep me going for six months if I didn't get anything else. Right. And something happened in the market and, and like that company shut everything. They took, they pulled everyone's credit cards. They started doing layoffs. Of course, the work I was doing was out yep. the door. And I found myself with little to no, like little to no prospects. And I went back to my, okay, in the last two or three years, who have I worked with that I can maybe go drum up more business? And what I realized was I was serving organizations that were giving me with their three to $5,000 project, everything they had for two years. Right. And I needed to change the type of, of work I was doing. And so what I realized was if I'm going to do this for 30 years, you know, I need to do it at a size and scope that makes sense. So I need people that are going to be able to spend X number of thousands of dollars year over year for three to five years. And if they can't do that, I can't afford to go after that type of work. Even though I could do the work, I have to go after that. And interestingly, you start getting that kind of clarity. You start communicating like that, and that's what you start seeing. So, Yeah, so two things. Just unpack that. Changed your time horizon. 30 years, mm -hmm. you start thinking about that. You're like, man, can I be working with, you know, 50, 60 small business owners at 5000 bucks a pop? Right. Or can I just get, like, two or three that will cover all that? It might take me a little bit longer to actually get those clients, but net-net it ends up being the same, if not better, because you're doing less work long-term, you know, in terms of hours and volume. And you're one person, right? Right. And that's the trap of, like, growth versus scale of, Right. Like, oh, okay, I can do a ton of volume and then I can hire more consultants, but you're really not getting more profitable by doing that. Right. So it's kind of a scale move to say, hey, here's what I'm worth. Go for the bigger ticket and I can do more with less. Right. And leverage more technology and work with a more sophisticated client. So I love And have that. more impact, quite honestly. If like that's that's what drives me more than than scalability. I'm not interested in owning a plumbing company. Right. I'm not I'm a pl I'm a plumber and I'm one of the best that there is. Yeah. And I have people that work with me who are the best plumbers themselves and and so that's how we've chose to operate peak solutions and when you you know if you're serving 50 people it's so hard it's so hard to serve them well yeah. but when you're serving three to five and you're going deep and wide and you know stories and you know them year over year you really are show, able to show the care that you have for them and the value that you provide for them and you're and by the way you're not a commodity yep. so pricing all of a sudden when pricing goes from commodity to value it works for everyone, works for the people paying for it, works for you for sure. And so that that whole that whole change was important. Will you expand on that from commodity to value? I think that'd be helpful for just our listeners. Yeah, commodity is you're trading you're trading product time service that other people have the same product time service. And so what they're trying to decide is on a budget or a spreadsheet, what's the best decision? And so you know, a roof might be a roof, might be a roof. Now I've got roofing friends that would disagree with me on that. But at the end of the day, the roof is the roof. Now my relationship with my roofer and how that comes across and how I, how I feel about that is different. And so in my world, there's a lot of people that can do what we do. Um, but what we're searching for is an outcome versus hours spent. So a lot of people in the consulting world talk about, you know, their hourly rate. 
I refuse to talk about an hourly rate because an hourly rate is something that one, a red line can get applied to and say, yeah. well, if, 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 uh, instead of 10 hours, could you do this in six hours? And, you know, in my world, if, if we think it's going to take 10 hours to do something, you want us to do it in six, we're likely to charge you more for that than less because it's more value for, for you to get it done in a quicker time frame. So value chart value pricing is more about outcome and, and results and commodity is more about what are you lining up and who else could do that for the same or cheaper. Yeah, that's great. And I don't know why that is. Maybe it's a newer entrepreneur thing, but it's like the race to the bottom. Like, oh, if I, I can do it cheaper than this guy. And that's a zero sum game. Use the example of roofing. Let's just talk about contracting in general. Most contracting businesses can win by simply answering the phone, following up, following through with what they said they're going to do, send you the quote on time, make sure everything is, goes off without a hitch, like literally just being better, yeah. not necessarily cheaper. Yeah. And I think that's the point you're trying to get across, yeah. which is value. It, when you're commodity-based, the only separating factor that you have is price. But value, let's talk about like if I told you you were going to lose your leg and in the next 24 hours you had to come up with 25000 bucks to save your leg, you're probably going to come up with 25000 bucks because your leg's incredibly valuable to you. Right. And so that's a good point. Most people don't think that way yep. when they're coming up with their pricing. Yep. Um, but I think that's invaluable. You, you kind of just gave me a little, even from my own work, of just always making sure we're focusing on the outcome. Yeah. It's like, who cares what the price is? Yeah. If you've tried all these other things. They haven't worked. How's that, how's that done for you? you know? yeah. Did, was that something that just kind of came by trial and error, like being outcome based versus hourly based was it constantly think, getting shut down or I think I thought about that my whole life. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. I grew up on a state research ranch. My dad was a PhD animal science guy. Okay. So I hung out with a lot of really smart people yeah. and who, who thought differently and taught me how to think. And that's one thing I think my parents, my parents did a lot of things. One of the things they did, I think really well was, was in, encouraged how to think and how to think differently and to value relationships. And so like from a, from a young age, I thought about that, but I also, um, I think being, <laughs> I think being lazy, <laughs> which, which I have a, I have a lazy gene. Like I work hard, but I also like, I don't want to work harder than I have to, right. um, you know, stepping back and thinking about how can I do this better? How can I do this more efficient? How can I, how can I accomplish the same thing with 10% of the resources? You know, that, you know, maybe that's, lazy maybe that's enterprising maybe it's a combination of the two but i just always have thought that way yeah it's it's interesting you know you're you're 20 something years into your career so you know, i'm talking to people who are a few years into their entrepreneurial journey and they're very much like you know i just i just jump in i just go get it and i just bang my head against the wall until i figure it out i'm a little bit more like you of like what's the outcome and then reverse engineer and okay what's the fastest way from point a to point b versus i'll find out how to get there as I go through it. I think that's a much better approach that our listeners can take away and, you know, start with the end game and yeah. reach engineer that when you're doing strategic planning, mm -hmm. what's that look like? Is that, <clears throat> you know, uh, long-term vision outlook, what we're going to do in the next 10 years, three years, one year, how does that process work? Well, first of all, we, we believe that if you look at what most people call strategic planning, it's neither strategic nor planning. Right. <laughs> It's it, it's a uh, tactical. It's you know coming up with a set of of action items, or it's or it's setting goals in the middle of the year that you already know you're going to hit or not hit. Yeah. You know, so like set the crappy stuff aside. Our, the way we approach strategic planning is what are the big ideas? What's the like? Who are you? Why do you exist? What's your purpose? We're trying to land that plane. We're trying to get clarity around purpose, vision, values, all of that. Love that. And if you don't have that, then what plan? You know. You build just like it's building your house on on sand, right. right? So what's the solid rock? Let's get that right. Who are you? Why do you exist? What's your purpose? What's your values? What's your vision? What's your mission? Let's get some clarity around that. Then let's look into the future and say, what assumptions are we making about the future? And today, I think the, the critical assumptions about the future, anything more than 12 or 18 months out is really just dreaming. Yep. I still think we should think that way, um, but the pace and speed at which – business evolves today is so quick. So you have to be agile and not nimble. So, you know, long-term is no longer five, 10, 20 years. 
So what are the critical assumptions that you have about the future? Based on those critical assumptions, what are impacting you the most? We, we play a game we call kill the company in three moves. <laughs> oh, shoot. And so, you know, we say, all right, if you were going to kill your company in three moves, what's the first move? And usually we kill the company in two moves. Like we know what two moves would kill your organization. And so are you, are, did, were, were those moves into your critical assumptions? And so what's the black swan that could, could say that? Nobody five years ago would have said, well, a global pandemic, <laughs> you know, but today you're like, okay, because I've seen that, what other things could change the way that we do things? You know, if you're an e-commerce business and all of a sudden the electrical infrastructure goes down and there's no you know, neutrons, protons, electrons are no longer, you know, able to move, how are you, how are you going to operate and what's that look like? Or, you know, some some famous 14 year old tweets or TikToks a video that totally destroys your product. Right. You know, so we're, what are those critical assumptions about the future? And then what are the big ideas? And when we look at the big ideas, what we're trying to think of is what's the one or two, or maybe if it's amazing, three things that if you did would have the greatest impact on all that other stuff we just talked about. And then let's go after those two or three things. And now if you double click on the two or three things, there might be 30 things you need to do to accomplish it. Let's only work after strategically the big ideas. And then the key, I think, and this is important, that's different from the way strategic planning has been done in the past, is the cadence at which you look at that has to be quick. It has to be, you know, the drumbeat to how you're looking at that has to be every two weeks, every four weeks, mm -hmm. at the minimum every quarter. And so with our clients, we pull up their plan we pull up their actions. We pull up their vision every month. Yep. And we like, is this still accurate? Are these assumptions still correct? Where are we at on this? Why is this a green light? Why is this a red light? Yeah. And we interrogate where things are going. And so then when you get to the next year for your next plan, you're just now iterating and you're iterating and you're iterating. And what we're doing is instead of conducting their strategic planning, we're helping them to think strategically. Yeah, that's good. That's probably just your wisdom, too, of like, you know, your first couple of years of banging your head against the wall and saying, man, if I just had a clear vision on where I was going, what I wanted to do. Absolutely. Because it's so easy to build a business that you don't actually love. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like flying a plane. If you're one degree off, I mean, you can end up in a totally different country, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or in the middle of the ocean, mm -hmm. for that matter. Mm -hmm. So you got to have the big, hairy, audacious goal. Then you're, you're back into like 18 months, and then you're just constantly reflecting on everything that you're doing on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Is there uh, a week-to-week you know, we keep the metrics on what's happening every single week. Yeah, we put we put we take those big three ideas, and then when you double click on them, there's things that need to happen, and so we'll build teams with owners and outcomes desired and milestones required, and 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 we've spent the last five years trying to figure out is there is there an app that we could build? Is there a you know some code we need to write that's going to help automate this? But nothing beats being pulled up on a team's call or in a conference room to report back on your stuff. So we, we build in an Excel spreadsheet, mm. all of these things that you, they're commitments you made. They're not my commitments. They're commitments that you made. Yep. And so on a weekly basis, we're checking in with the people who made those commitments, talk to us about it. How's this going? And then when we have our big cadence, those, those action item leaders are reporting in on where they're, where they're at with everything. How might a new entrepreneur leverage that same kind of planning to kind of get started? You know? Yeah. Is it, is it setting, because if you, three action items, one person, I'm thinking, I don't have a team. I'm just trying to get it off the ground. What's your best advice? For yeah. You? What's the one thing that needs to happen in order for, for this business to advance to whatever the next stage is? And it's, you know, I think of it like a track. My kids are track athletes <laughs> and they, you know, my favorite race on planet earth is the miles. That's, you know, it's, everyone loves the sprints and the hurdles and all these things, but the mile is so fantastic because if in the first lap you don't put yourself in a position to win it, you never will. You don't have to be leading, but you have to do that. So like, what's that first lap to the new entrepreneur that says, if I'm not in this position to get a chance to win this race in the first lap, then, then I may not have enough strength in laps two, three, four to ever catch up. So I've got it. What is that? And so I think some clarity on what's that one thing that you've, got to do what's the plane that needs to be landed the customer that needs to be got the you know the the 
financial resources that need to be built up, whatever it is, what is that? And what are the two things I need to do every day to get towards that? And every day, you know, being working towards that, toward that goal. And, um, I, I think that a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs are competitive people by nature. And so they, they want to win, but they want to win at everything, mm. you know? So you go to a football game, you go to a basketball game, you, you go, um, you know, to a baseball game, you don't have to ask 32 people whether your team is winning or not. Right. You look up, you see a scoreboard, you know whether you're winning. Now, there's a thousand data points that you're going to look at after. You know, what was the yards per carry? What was the yards after catch? How many tackles? How many, you know, rushed passes? How many, all of those, you're going to look at all of those things. But at the end of the day, all you need to know is home and away. Yeah. What's the score? How much time is left? And so I think entrepreneurs tend to overemphasize all of the 30 things that they can look at versus what's the home and away? What's the, what do I have to win? When I look up at a scoreboard and say, am I winning? They need to be able to have that one or two metrics every day to decide whether they're winning or not. And for some, it might be, I'm making 10 calls a day. And you look up and it's, I've only made eight, so I'm not winning until I make that 10th call. Because that's a lead activity that, that turns into business. Um, and instead, a lot of entrepreneurs will look up and they'll see, you know, how many minutes did they spend, which is a lag measure. Right. It's like I did this, and it's like, oh crap, I didn't get any new customers. So, you know, focusing on those, it's a four disciplines of execution thing. I think every every entrepreneur should build their system based on some version of the four disciplines of execution. Which is what it's a book that uh, the Franklin Covey Group put out, and the you know, it's create a compelling scoreboard. You know, have have these these goals that are compelling and work towards it and reinforce it. So um, the disciplines of execution are important. And so a lot of times entrepreneurs become entrepreneurs because they're amazing doers of something. And, and that's not necessarily what's needed to get around the second, by the way, the second lap is where you, you, you exert your dominance and you start to maybe play some mind games with the other field of where you're at and so into that second lap, you come in and it's like, okay, now this is the crew that's working towards um, winning this race. And, and most people get through the second lap. Most milers get through the second lap and they're like, okay. And some portion of the group they're in starts slowing down. The third lap's the hardest of all four laps. And in that third lap, everyone starts to slow down. It's usually of the four, the slowest lap. And that's the time that the winners put the hammer down. That's when they start to say, I'm going to fight past this pain. I'm going to fight past this frustration. I'm going to fight past what I know. What I know is to do what everyone else is doing. And, and when everyone else is doing something, you need to be doing something different. And then you get into that fourth lap and you get to really find out who did all the work <laughs> to finally get to the place where they can cross that finish line first. And what would that look like in real business terms? They have a team that's operating efficiently without them. A yeah. An operating company that doesn't necessarily. Need yeah. Them. Third lap is you're sitting here going, I don't have the resources to do this. I need to, I need to take on investors. It's like, maybe you need to take on investors or maybe you just need to go sell more and let your customers be your investors. Maybe you need your product to, you know, pre-sell your product or pre-sell your services or go partner with, with someone who is equally interested in your product or service being, being, um, delivered to their customers or their network and start doing those difficult things. The easy thing is to go raise money, yeah. go raise money, dilute your value, let other people start telling you what to do. Maybe that's the right answer. And for some people it is, but for the vast majority, they go raise money, they bring on investors and it's the, it's the beginning of the end for, you know, the, the longevity. A hundred percent. And it often it's just a bandaid on a gaping wound. You know, it's your, throwing money at something that's not necessarily as dialed as it could be. You know, I think the other thing in that, in that race that you should be thinking about as a new entrepreneur is just, you should be building uh, some sort of processes or system that allow you to get out of that function in the business yeah. as quickly as possible. Yeah. I may be the best salesperson. That's great. But I got to delegate in order to elevate my thinking and go from thinking about hundred dollar an hour work to hundred thousand dollar an hour work. Right. And the only way I can do that is to quickly hand this off to somebody else maybe I get two sales guys and they're 80% as good as me. That's fine. They're still doing more work than I could as an individual. And now I'm go working on those big relationships. Yeah. 
And I don't think that happens soon enough is they, they wait too long to build those systems and figure out how they're going to replace themselves. And then they build a job for themselves. Yeah. And yeah. then they can't even imagine because they're going 100 miles an hour how they're going to actually unwind that whole entire thing yeah. and put somebody in place because I just don't have time to train them. I have to go close these deals. Yeah. And now you're back on the same treadmill that you tried to get off of the first time. Right. You know. Well, you've you've just you've just created a bigger job for yourself. A worse one. More with weight, or, weight. More yeah. risk. Right? Exactly. Yeah. All the risk. One thing that most entrepreneurs don't don't utilize well is when you get to the hiring phase and building your team out. You start looking at the weaknesses that you have and let me go fill this weakness and fill that weakness. This, this isn't the case for everyone. So if you're listening, this might not be for you, but it might actually. And that is, I think that the first person you should hire in your business is someone to make you more efficient. Mm. And the second person that you should hire is another person to make you more efficient. That might be an assistant. That might be an admin. That might be a salesperson. But the thing is, is that you need to be for a long period of time, the most effective, efficient person in your, in your organization. And a lot of times what we do is we hire people that don't make us more efficient. They actually drag us down and put us in places where we're not, because no one's going to, no one's going to tend to your business like you do at all. And so you can't, you know, someone who's going to oversee the operations so you can go out and continue to see more customers or if your strength is in the operations, someone who can go see the customers so you can oversee the operations. But whatever it is that, that that allows you to use more of your genius, I think is an important thing. But the problem with that is then eventually you need to hire someone that's going to take all that you are doing so that you can go to that $100,000 an hour yeah. thinking. And that's the third lap for a lot of entrepreneurs is I don't want to do that. I like doing this. I want to continue. What do you think that is? Is is that an identity crisis? Yeah, I I think that it's uh, I think it's identity crisis. I think we get we definitely get our identity tied into that what we do. I also think it's a it's a relationship to risk situation. It's I'm going to let go of this thing that that I had my hands all over. My fingerprints are all over this, and now in order for me to scale and move to the next level of growth, I have to not just walk away from it. I have to like give it away to others who are probably going to do it way differently than I do it. And so like that discomfort is, is a big challenge. Do you think that's the reason why businesses fail? Like I have this belief that, you know, businesses, it's not money. It's not the economy. It's when the, the, the needs of the business exceed the skill set of the entrepreneur. Yeah. And they're either unwilling to replace themselves or go to that place. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend who used to say the two biggest competitors for any business owner is fear and apathy. Um, I would add arrogance mm. to that. And, and the arrogance that I know better, like entrepreneurs, we are hard to serve. We're hard to serve because we think we know it better. And in many cases, the reason why we think that is because it's been true. Right. Like we did this better than someone else. And so that, that arrogance that you're the only one that can do this and it can't be done any better than you. And then this fear of what might happen if it's done differently, all of that place. So then, so then you start doubling down Mm. on what you know, and you start doubling down on your beliefs and you, what you stop doing is inviting people in who disagree. You stop, you stop getting the truth. People stop telling you the truth. Echo chamber. Yeah, it's absolutely what it is. And most entrepreneurs create, their own echo chamber, not on purpose. Yeah. It's by our actions. So how do you, how do you prevent that from you? Like, how do you take inventory and protect yourself from going down that path? I feel like I'm relatively good at it, but I can, I can feel myself sometimes of just being like, you know what? Never mind. I I got it. I'll just run with this. Um, And it only, the problem only exacerbates as you grow because yeah, you're, a lot of your life to building something but yeah is there tactics you know especially when you're doing executive coaching do you help these people break away from themselves basically yeah i well so executive coaching like this is why that world of peer networking groups executive coaching small group you know whatever is so important because you need a mirror you need a reflection of what does it look like on the other side of you yeah and you know just yesterday my wife's like 
you need to lose some weight and you need to get fit and I'm going to help you. And I was like, I didn't want to hear that. Ouch. She was right on both cases. <laughs> she's right times a hundred. And I didn't like it. I didn't like anything about that. Yeah. But she's, that's why she's my best friend because yeah. she's willing to tell me that, you know, um, that's awesome. That oh, you guys have that relationship. Well, it's, it, it's awesome and not awesome. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. It doesn't feel good, but it's, it's what you need to hear. So, yeah. so one, you need to have, you need to have that version. That's that tribe who's going to tell you what you don't want to hear. And you need to be willing to do that. And the only way that you do that is you have to have some regular cadence. So if, if I wait to our anniversary for her to tell me the truth, that doesn't work. So yeah, then it's a hard conversation, right? It's a very hard conversation. It's not welcome and warranted. And so it's like, hey, I've, been, I've been overweight for a year. Lay yeah. off me. Oh, yeah. I mean, 20 years. This is <laughs> yeah. not, this is not news. <laughs> Why is this a problem now? Yeah, exactly. It was not a problem for me. You're telling me it is for you. Yep. So I think that the cadence of asking for that feedback, you have to ask for that feedback. Uh, you have to be humble. Yeah. And we're entrepreneurs, we're hungry. We're plenty hungry, but we got to exhibit this humility and the humility to ask the tough questions. I'll give you some examples of, of questions. You find the two or three, and that's it. Just two or three questions on a regular case. Number one, what deeply held conviction do I have right now that's probably wrong? about my business, about my life, about my politics, about my family, about my community, whatever it is. And like, what, what am I deeply holding on to right now that might be wrong? That's a good question. Um, what am I doing now that's planting a seed of demise later? Most of our seeds of demise that we plant now were planted when things were going really, 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 really great. When, when, when you're on an upward growth curve, that's when we plant these seeds that later show up as a seed of demise where, you know, things are going great. I have all the answers. I don't need a board of directors. I don't need someone telling me what to do. Look at what I've accomplished. Boom, boom, boom. And then when you start to fail or go past the maturity of that, you realize, oh my gosh, way back then I didn't have people speaking into my life about this. So, you know, yeah. what seeds of demise am I planting now? There's a saying in the stock in the stock world that everybody's a genius in a bull market. Yeah, that's an example of that. Yeah, it's a perfect example. Why would you Why would you interrogate or question that? Because if I did question or interrogate that, I might not have gotten all of the growth in that bull market that I could have gotten, yeah. but also would have eliminated my loss. So what's my What's my discipline? That's That's the thing. And it's like the other question is, what discipline is needed for me? Where am I undisciplined right now? And then my favorite question of all questions, and we ask this uh, 10 times a day to people, is what's required of me right now? Like right now, specifically, what's required of me? And if you wake up every day with the posture of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live a life and, and serve and lead and run my business based on what's needed from me versus what do I want to do, what have I always done, that really changes the way that you approach things. Mm, that's so good. Yeah, you have this, and that's a different perspective because it puts your people first. Mm. You know, you're. I, I have a deep rooted fear of like screwing it up and then screwing over all my employees. Mm -hmm. That's what actually motivates me to do the thing that maybe like I know I should be working on that I don't want to. It's like mm -hmm. the reason I need to be working on this is because it's important. And if I don't do it, we run the risk of not hitting the goal and me having to make some changes that maybe aren't good for everybody else. And they're good for the business, but not for my employees. And so, yeah, that's, man, that is, this might be my favorite podcast <laughs> so far. No, come on. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, and definitely frame shifting for me. Like you, you just taught me some things. Okay. Last thing, and I'll let you get out of here. What would you tell new or aspiring entrepreneurs about starting a business that they might be considering or, or maybe the business that they haven't not, not been considering? Mm-hmm. I, I think there's a couple of questions that we all have to wrestle to the ground. And we already talked about one of them is, you know, what, what kind of life do you want to have? What, why are you doing this? What is this that that's most important to you? Because when you're serving, building something to sell it so you can make a lot of money, that's not a terrible, it's not a terrible reason to do something, but it's probably not going to be enough when you're in the third lap and everyone's slowing down. Lactic acid's and, kicking yeah, in. It's kicking in that you're gonna that you're gonna be able to fight through it. So that's probably not big enough. 
and you know really think about what are you willing to sacrifice along the way to do this because I don't believe that there's such a thing as a work-life balance. Uh, I think it's a work-life sacrifice. Mm. And so what are you willing to sacrifice in your personal life to be successful here? And also what are you willing to sacrifice in your work life to be successful at home? I personally am, am very, very willing to sacrifice my professional growth and opportunity and money to have a personal life that is fulfilling and to raise these young men that God's entrusted me to to raise so that they can be, you know, so for generations to come. So, right. I, so I'm willing to sacrifice that. And the um, the other question that we haven't talked about is, are you running to something or are you running away from something? And I think a lot of times when I talk to young entrepreneurs or new entrepreneurs, so many of them are running from something. They're running from the dredges of corporate life. They're running from a crappy boss. They're running from you know, this mindset that says that you're only successful if you have something that you own yourself versus running to something. And when you run to something, lap three, lap four, lap five, like if you can keep going, you can keep going through all of the challenges when you're literally running to something that is, is important. So, mm, that's so good. I, I think that's an important thing. And then like practical business stuff, um, there's metrics and numbers and margins and also and and financial targets and all of those things. You should have those, um, but I think that the more important than the measures and the the um, those targets is is for you to define what winning looks like. And since you're competitive, define winning in addition to those items, and then you have a barometer. No, are we winning? And if we're not, if we're not winning in the things that are most important, but we're winning in these financial metrics. Okay, that's one different thing of then I'm not winning in the things that are important to me. I'm not winning in the financial metrics. I'm not winning at home. You know, I want to win at life and I want to win at work. Yeah. You know, I want to win all the way around. And so I want to know what a win looks like. And I think that's something that kind of ties all of those together. You add those all those thoughts and questions like, am I winning? What does that look like? What's my scoreboard? Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, because we constantly have to. I call it stacking the wins because you're going to get kicked in the teeth constantly when you feel like, man, I suck or this isn't good or the business is failing or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. You got to be able to recenter yourself. So mm-hmm. that's invaluable. Well, it's about our time, man. This was awesome. It flew by. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks and for having me. Hopefully a year from now, come back and do it all over again. I'd love to. And you can share all the cool stuff that you're doing in your business. That's great. You're doing a good thing. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Yeah.